All right, in the, at the end of the previous video, um, we sort of arrived at this step where we were like, great, if I want to graph polynomial functions, if I want to work with polynomial or rational inequalities, fundamentally what I need to be able to do is find roots. This was always a very important step in any of these graphing or inequality problems. Find where it equals zero. And that is what this section is all about. Can I find the zeros of polynomials? If you're dealing with a rational function, remember the numerator and denominator are both polynomials, and then roots in the numerator gave you roots of the function, and roots in the denominator gave you missing points from the domain and frequently also vertical asymptotes. So a lot of this chapter boils down to, can you find the zeros of a polynomial? Well, there are some techniques to dealing with this problem. You can see from this list of objectives, it's fairly lengthy. This is one of the more challenging sections that we've seen so far. So first, there's something called the remainder and factor theorems. This is fairly straightforward, but it's a way to identify, is this a root or is it not? There's something called Descartes' rule of signs and something called the rational zeros theorem, which give us a complementary set of information. The first Descartes' rule of signs tells us how many roots there might be. It doesn't definitively answer it, but it gives us some possible uh, quantities of roots. The second, the rational zeros theorem says, here are some numbers that you might test out as roots. It gives you a sort of nice finite length list of if there is a root that is a fraction, here are the possible ones it could be. So of all of the numbers that you might have tried to plug in, it narrows it down to a, a short collection. And between the two of those things, how many roots there might be, and here's a collection of possible roots, you can get a lot of information. So with that, you can find the real zeros of a polynomial function, which means you might be able to solve polynomial equations. There's also, towards the end, a pair of a bit more abstract results on bounding, how large a root could possibly be, and something called the intermediate value theorem. But we'll go through all of it. It will be over the course of several videos. So first, we're going to have to get comfortable doing division with polynomials. So suppose f of x and g of x are polynomial functions. Okay, specifically, the denominator is of degree greater than zero, so I'm not dividing by a constant. But actually dividing by a proper polynomial of degree one or larger. Then I can find a polynomial Q and a polynomial R for which two things happen. Okay. Either the left or the right, they both mean the same thing. If you just multiply both sides by G of X, you'll get the same thing on both. Okay. <clears throat> and specifically, the big thing is that R, which is either this numerator or this remainder, depending on how you write it, it's either the zero polynomial or its degree is strictly smaller than that of g of x. Okay, So our original functions, f and g, I might have had a big degree in f of x and a small degree in g of x. So I had a bigger power on top and smaller powers on the bottom. I can rewrite it as an actual polynomial, not a rational function, plus now I have a rational function where the numerator has smaller degree. That's the important part. We can rewrite a rational function as a polynomial plus a rational function where the numerator has smaller degree. Okay. That's just the division algorithm. And if you've been doing polynomial division, which is sort of in the prerequisites, it's a college algebra thing, so we should have learned how to do that you've implicitly been doing it already. Anytime you have a rational function, if the degree on top was bigger, then you can do this polynomial division to get out a polynomial plus a rational function where the numerator has smaller degree. Now, the remainder theorem is actually a lot more straightforward to state. Okay. If you take f of x and divide it by x minus c, when you apply that previous result, you're gonna get a polynomial plus a remainder over the same denominator x minus c. Now, what's the degree of x minus c? It's a degree one polynomial. Therefore, what's the degree of r? It's got to be smaller, which means it's got to be degree zero, 
In other words, r of x must equal a constant. Specifically, which constant is it? f of c. So I'm going to clear off my pen marks to restate this. The way this can be restated is f of x over x minus c can be written as another polynomial plus specifically the value f of c over x minus c, where q is some other polynomial. Okay, this is the remainder theorem. If you divide by x minus c, your remainder is exactly f of c. So find the remainder when x cubed minus 5x squared minus 6 is divided by the following. Here's the long way to do it. All right, let's do x minus 2 divided into x cubed minus 5x squared plus 0x, don't forget the x term, minus 6. I do the division. I need an x squared. I get x cubed minus 2x squared. I do the subtraction. We have negative 3x squared, so now I need a minus 3x, giving me a minus 3x squared plus 6x. I do the subtraction. We get a negative 6x, so now I need a minus 6. So I had negative 6x minus 6. And now I do that multiplication minus 6. We get minus 6x plus 12. I do the subtraction. We get minus 18. So the remainder is 18. That's the long way to do it. Okay. And similarly, the long way to do the second one is to actually do the division. It's doable, but this is not how you should be doing it. If we use the theorem we just learned, all you have to do is compute for the first one, what is f of 2? It's negative 18. Because remember, if you divide by a linear term of x minus a number, the remainder is f of that number. So since we divided by x minus 2, the remainder is exactly f of 2, which is minus 18. So for part b, instead of doing the division, just compute f of negative 4 and get negative 150. That's all well and good. What's really of interest is, so the remainder theorem just says f of x over x minus c is equal to q of x plus f of c over x minus c, f of c. What's really useful, that was my phone, not yours, don't worry. What's really useful for us is that what if f of c is zero? Then there is no remainder. Then I can ignore this completely in which case, I can multiply both sides by x minus c and get f of x is q of x times x minus c. In other words, x minus c is a factor. So x, and we've used this kind of implicitly along the way, x minus c is a factor exactly when c is a root. Okay? And this is both ways. If c is a root, x minus c is a factor. If x minus c is a factor, then c is a root. So use that version to determine whether x cubed minus 2x squared plus 3x minus 6 can be factored with an x minus 2 or with an x plus 1. The long way to do it is to do the polynomial division and see what the remainder is. A faster way to find the error is just to compute f of c. So since the first term asks us is x minus 2 a factor, we just plug 2 in. f of 2 is 0, and therefore x minus 2 is a factor. For part b, x plus 1 was what we were trying to test. That means I need to plug in f of negative 1. You could do division. Um, alternately, you can just compute f of negative 1 from the original version of the function and not get 0. Since f of negative 1 isn't 0, x plus 1 is not a factor. OK, so that's mostly review. OK, the fact that zeros of polynomials corresponds to factors is something we've been using. Um, back in college, I'll do some work of factoring polynomials. So here's something, something new. If I have a polynomial, how many zeros can it have? It can't have more than its degree. 
So if I'm a degree three polynomial, I have at most three zeros. If I'm a degree six polynomial, at most six zeros. Okay, so degree n polynomial at most n roots, including multiplicity. So what that means is, here's a polynomial, x minus 2 squared times x plus 3 times x plus 8 to the fourth. What are the roots? 2, negative 3, negative 8. What are the corresponding multiplicities of those roots? 2, 1, and 4, respectively. What's the degree of this polynomial? 7. If I multiplied the whole thing out, this term here is going to give me an x squared plus some other stuff. This gives me an x plus some other stuff. This is ultimately going to give me an x to the fourth plus some other stuff. When I multiply them all out, I'm going to get an x to the seventh as my highest power. So this could have at most seven roots up to multiplicity. It has this root four times, this root once, and this root twice. So it does have seven roots up to multiplicity, but not more than that. The way we're going to use this result, and we'll start a new video about this in just a minute, is if you're looking at a degree 3 polynomial, how many roots can it have? At most 3. So if you happen to find 3 roots, you know you're done. That's really how we're going to use it. If you find as many roots as it could possibly have, you don't have to keep looking. But we're going, we're going to go ahead and stop this video here, so come back for the next one.